Okay. So today we are gonna speak about multimodal interaction. And as I mentioned you uh, before starting the, the recording, uh, I have some question for you during this um, lecture that hopefully we'll start today and, and tomorrow, the, the lecture, not the question, obviously. And this is, as you may imagine, and as in the previous week, this, this lecture is not linked to the process that we are following for, for the project, uh, but is something uh, other part, the theoretical part, more advanced part that we would like to cover in the course. And it should be, well, the, the first one about the designing for inclusivity uh, last week, then there is this one about multimodal interaction. And next week we will also have one, a lecture about human AI interaction with a specific use case uh, in, of a, let's say an intelligent uh, system as, as an example. Obviously all these things here could last weeks. We can spend weeks speaking about multimodal interaction. We can have a, an additional course about the human AI interaction, but just to give you some hints, some understanding of these topics. To, to proceed, also appreciate something that is not um, standard and basic like the things that we, we have done up to now. And then we will uh, start again with the process for the evaluation after this, uh, for, for the other kind of evaluation like user studies and uh, usability studies and so on uh, after this, this two part. But well, today multimodal interaction. And the first question that I have for you is, uh, what is multimodal for you? What does it mean a multimodal interface in your opinion? I, I will provide you a more, let's say, formal definition, but any idea of what we are referring with this multimodal? Any idea? So multiple types of interaction means different way. Yeah, let, let's look some, let's say more, what, what do you mean for different way of interaction, to interact the different ways of interacting or multiple types of interaction? They, they are probably right, yeah. Okay, so somebody's saying different types of UI for different devices. Not different channels. I prefer this channel. I can use my voice on my finger. Uh, which ago you can touch or button uh, or or mouse. I think you know. Uh, probably it's touch touch screen or clicking on a mouse. Probably. Uh, yeah. Basically, these are correct, more or less correct example. Is using. Uh, more, and we will see the, the definition, formal definition of the slides, but we are using multiple uh, channels, multiple uh, ways so like voice and gestures, fingers and touch that you say for uh, producing uh, uh, an interaction. So having an interface that is able to uh, accept, for instance, if we go with your example, uh, commands via voice or commands via gesture like in a touch screen, so pressing something. And, and, and typically this multimodal not only means uh, one way or another, but means putting together this thing. So a user interface that you can use with uh, let's say voice or, or touch, but typically that you can use in a combined way to support your goal or to reach your goal. And multimodal interface in a sense mimics what uh, what human beings are doing. So now, I, I don't know you because I, I, I don't see your, your environment, but uh, where you are, but here I am, uh, I'm using my vision. I'm looking at the screen in front of me, at the chat here. Uh, I am speaking. So I'm just doing two things at a time. I'm looking at things. We, we normally do all these things at, at the same time. I, we, I, I'm looking at this, I'm speaking and I'm hearing 
uh, from, from the environment, uh, what happens in the environment, uh, maybe there is a car that is moving, uh, that is passing through my, uh, under my window or, or something like that. So we, we all do these things together in the same time. Also you probably, you are listening to me, you are listening to what happens in, so hopefully you're listening to me, you are listening what happens in your room or whatever you are uh, around you, you are looking at screen, you maybe are uh, taking notes. So you're, you're doing, you're doing, you're using your senses, your channels to do a lot of things together and towards reaching a specific goal that for instance now is to, uh, to follow this lecture and also in the same time to get sense of the environment where you are. So that something is strange in the environment, you can react. This is something that we do as human being naturally, but it's something that a user interface cannot do in a sense naturally. So today, and I was saying also a bit tomorrow, we are speaking about this multimodal interaction that are strongly linked with our senses and with our channels, let's say input output, human input, human output uh, in general. So before starting, just a brief recap, since these things are connected uh, about last week. So last week we uh, spoke about designing for diversity and that uh, we, we spoke about senses. We, we, we have seen that the, the interaction with the technology that we design depends on what we can understand, remember, see, hear, say, and touch, and things together, uh, all the, also this thing together, in a, maybe not all to them, them together, but a subset of these could be together. And uh, we would also design to reflect this diversity. We would like to have maybe some interfaces that uh, can be useful for a person that don't see either permanently or temporary, or situationally, and maybe that has problem speaking. So we need to put together, we can, we can consider putting together different way of interacting uh, by reusing some of your word in the chat. So some, some different channels for interacting uh, either in input and in output uh, with uh, a user interface, whatever it is. And so, so the main question that we, we can have uh, are these two here in the slides. Uh, can we design an application or a system that leverages on multiple senses and abilities at the same time? And how much senses, how much abilities contemporary? And can we provide different input output mechanism maybe that are adaptable to different contexts and maybe for different people, for different culture, for different languages, and so on. And today, and again tomorrow in this lecture, we will try to answer these, these two questions uh, by providing some example and some concept and some ideas on how to uh, design this application or system, how to provide different input output mechanism, when it's better one, when it's better another mechanism, and so on. Um, and also we can try to imagine how we can design an application. So obviously for, for design application, we, we can leverage on what we already know. We know how to design an application following a human-centered process. And that is, that process is fine, that process can be followed. And we can consider all the things that we have said last week about designing for diversity. But, and so this is, you know, the, the process. So how to design is that, but which senses, how many senses together to do what, which abilities and how we can incorporate this thing. And how to incorporate this thing, I, I, I brought two, ans two answers about how we can create this application on multiple senses, how we can use these multiple senses and abilities to, to do what, uh, using these multiple senses ability at the same time and in different contexts for different people. And so the first answer that I, I, I give to, to this question is we can use uh, multiple senses and abilities 
for providing a redundant uh, interaction. Uh, what do I mean for redundant or redundancy uh, as is written here? Uh, I mean that we can have maybe a user interface uh, for which we uh, use uh, voice for interact with, and we also use, um, let's say, gaze hmm, for interact with. Uh, redundancy means that the same interface is able to provide or to accept the same information, the same commands using both modality. Hmm. Another example, maybe you have um, a user interface, graphical user interface. So you click with the mouse and the keyboard, you are using like Word or software like this. And so you're using vision that is one of the sense. Uh, and for some important features of this user interface, you also have some speech from the computer to you. So you're leveraging on two senses, on vision and hearing for uh, interacting with this application. And this application is using these this, this two human senses to provide redundancy, to provide the same information, both in uh, a visual uh, format and uh, a vocal format for hearing. Why? Because people, could be distracted because maybe the, the user interface has too many things on the screen and having also a notification, having also uh, some reminder in a different channel could help focus and could maybe alert people in doing things. So not just the user interface that uses, uh, let's say vision for one thing and earring for a totally different thing or in totally different moment, but combine together these multiple senses towards a unique goal to provide a, a uniform information, to provide the user with the information that matter in that moment. So redundancy. Another way to create an application or a system that could leverage multiple senses and ability at the same time is to make this application, for instance, compatible with assistive technologies. And, and I, I'm, I'm going to ask you about the third way, not necessarily alternative to this two, these two, uh, but one, one other things to put here, at least one should be in your mind. So this is the next question for you. And uh, I'm anticipating this so that you can start thinking and typing in the chat. Uh, so one way is through redundancy provide, use multiple senses, multiple channel to provide the same information, the same important information, the same fundamental information to the user. And the other is to have this user interface. Let's imagine a graphical user interface for now, compatible with assistive technology. Uh, I have a question before, actually. Uh, do you know what is an assistive technology? We, we mentioned some of that, there's some of those last week, but I don't remember if I, Define. I defined uh, assistive technology or not. It's like the special controller for the Xbox. Uh, yes, it's also you in the visual design uh, lecture. You at certain point you should have seen uh, some heat map provided by the an eye tracker. Is it correct? Yeah. So yes, like eye tracking, eye tracking, eye tracking. So eye tracking is could be used as an assistive technology uh, for getting the gaze of the person where where the people where the person is is looking at on a screen or in a, in a space, an environment and react to this. Uh, another example, so we can make our application, our graphical user interface compatible with a tracker, for instance. So we are not adding a different channel because we are still relying on vision, on eyes, but we are making our application compatible with a net tracker that has its own peculiarity. So for instance, it, and a tracker is not, the, and we will see a tracker in a few slides, but for instance, a tracker, with a tracker, you cannot have the same precision in selecting things 
that you have with the mouse nowadays, at least. They are quite precise now, but you don't have the same selection, the same capability of doing this very, very fine selection with a mouse. If you have two very small, two, two small buttons, that would be, you shouldn't have for, let's say, usability uh, or some design guideline, but let's imagine that we have two small buttons with the mouse, you have no problem in selecting one or the other. If you are focused, uh, but with a tracker, even if you are really, really focused, you don't have the precision, the, the needed precision to uh, select the right button because they are maybe too small to close each other. So your, your application should be compatible with this assistive technology. So you have to redesign something, you should consider some guidelines in designing your, let's say, original graphical user interface to also include uh, features uh, needed for assistive technology. So like buttons that are a little bit bigger than usual, just for uh, considering this less, this, this precision that could be minor with a tracker and so on. So this is an example. Another example of assistive technology are screen readers that I briefly mentioned. So screen readers are uh, software tools that read what is uh, on screen. So if you are, your, your graphical user interface has a lot of images like let's say a web page, a website or a web application that is, uh, it has a lot of images, you should provide some sentences that accompany these images. So otherwise a screen reader and a person who is blind cannot read the image, cannot get meaning from the image because the screen reader is able to read everything here. So you can read full, the full text here with also identifying that maybe this is a header and this is a bullet point of first level and this is a bullet point of second level and read all whole redundancy and so on. But if you have an image, if you have a video, if you have a multimedia content, uh, he's not able to, to understand what is in the content, in the, in the multimedia content and provide a textual description to the, uh, to the user that, who is blind to read the textual description of that. So uh, this compatibility uh, is, for instance, for images is setting the alternative text for images. So if you are a developer and you are creating a web application where people are not creating new things, uh, all your image, it's your responsibility to add the alternative text to all your image, if the, your image are important or not just uh, for decoration. And similarly, if you are using videos, it's the responsibility to the developer to add uh, some way for having ev like blind people, uh, temporary, permanent or situational people that cannot see for a reason uh, access to your, your, to your application. Mm -hmm. And this is done, for instance, speaking about uh, alternative text in very different way. So for instance, uh, Facebook uh, uses some uh, algorithm of machine learning algorithms to uh, trying to extract alternative text from image. And so to trying to extract the content of an image and provide automatically for most of the images an alternative text. Then, so when you put an image on Facebook, uh, you should maybe not immediately, but after a while, uh, have an alternative text for that image. And it's done automatically. Uh, Twitter provides a totally different mechanism. Twitter relies to the user. So the developer of the Twitter user interface, uh, when you put an image on Twitter, ask you if you want to add an alternative text. And the user could say no or yes. So in that case, the compatibility is not maximum because it's saying the user that put the image, uh, please add an alternative text, but there is the, the concept, there is at least the option to add an alternative text to the image. So these are two different way of increasing, three different way to increasing compatibility with assistive technology. 
uh, you can have a tracker, so a redesign or adapt your interface to support a tracker, so the, maybe bigger button uh, than, than expected. Uh, for alt text, either provide an alternative text, use some fancy algorithms to generate a good version of these, and or ask people who are inserting this image to uh, provide a meaningful alternative text to describe what is in the image. And this is just two example. A third example that may came to your mind, suggestion, it may have, uh, uh, one, one thing came to my mind uh, today when I was revising these slides from last year uh, about uh, languages, about different countries and culture, and obviously a graphical user interface. Any idea? Mm, yes, a software magnifier for the display could be, mm, yeah, could be one way. Uh, but but typically it's the operating system and we will see in the next slide um, that provides this feature because this could be useful for many, many different applications. So something like, like imagine to, to create your, your prototype and to, to have to, uh, let's say, adapt your prototype and not to multiple senses and abilities, but to different contexts and different people, different countries without using redundancy and compatibility with assistive technology that you can obviously use, but focusing for instance on different contexts and different people and different countries and different languages. And then any other example could be reasonable. But focus on a single application more than an operating system that can provide uh, features like a software magnifier. Different translation is something useful, obviously, if you are creating a mobile, a mobile an application and it's just in Italian, it, it is for just people who speak Italian, that is a relatively small uh, population, let's say worldwide. Um, if you have English, you can, well, you can translate a, an interface from one language to another in the same interface. Why it would have been the same interface, different translation? Why not? We have your user interface in Italian and you have uh, the user interface in English and maybe also cultural translation. Yeah, it's more similar to what I had in my mind. Yes, right, left interfaces, exactly. So supporting also different culture. So this, right to left interface, it's, it's one thing. So you have, you design a user interface and, and we wrote from, from left to right. So everything in our interface, the text, but also the alignment of the objects, follow the left to right, uh, uh, let's say path. Hmm? So we are putting the yes button in one way, in one side and the no button after the uh, the, the 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 yes button in in a same in an order and we we start uh, on the left and we put maybe on the right other things that are maybe less important or just uh, or we put a menu on the left and not on the right and if we have a top menu in a user interface we add the first element uh, maybe the home the home icon is uh, on on the left and then there is other icons that are uh, more distant from the home. So this, this could be a way for uh, providing different uh, interfaces for different contexts. So not just uh, surely translating everything from a 
left to right language like Italian or English or most of the Western languages to uh, a language that is right to left. But this doesn't mean only translating the text and putting everything aligned on the other side of the screen. This also has an impact on buttons because maybe the buttons that for, for us are normally to have one on the left and one on the right and, and the confirmation maybe is on the left should be switched. Uh, maybe on that line when you're moving text, uh, you have some items. So when you move text from one side to the other, you, you should be, sh be aware that there is some other things that should go uh, probably in another place or should have some consideration. So it's not just you know translating the text and, and putting a line to to the right to the text. It's also considering where the button is, when the buttons are, uh, where the menu is. Maybe the home, but the button for the home, the icon for the home shouldn't be the first item on the left, but should become the first item on on the right. And if the menu is one side, should should move to the other. So all these kind of things that are. Uh, not only related to the text and the translation, but also cultural uh, norm, cultural behavior of different languages in different parts of the world. And another, another way, it was a gesture recognizer through the camera for people with mobility difficulties. Uh, it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's more about probably providing redundancy in a way, uh, in input more than output or compatibility with uh, accessibility. But yes, it could be also something that, so your application is able to uh, recognize, uh, to, to use mouse and keyboard, but also recognize some gesture if you cannot uh, use for any reason. Uh, so alternative way of interacting with application. Hmm? So these, these are, we can, we can move uh, a lot about the redundancy, compatibility, uh, different cultural norm, alternative way of producing uh, um, interaction and so on. Uh, so we have a question. Uh, we can say that by redundancy, we mean a system that combines some more than one sense in with which it provides us with information, right? Uh, yes, more or less. For, for analysis, we mean that a system that combines more than one channel, because the human senses are often in just in one way and on the other, but yeah, a channel um, that com uh, and provide or accept the same or uh, the same set of important information, relevant information. does this answer. Okay, so well, just to, to come back to partially redundancy and partially to the magnifier that some of you was breathing in the chat. Uh, these are, for instance, the accessibility feature that uh, every, in reality, every operating system has. These are just two examples. There is the accessibility uh, settings in macOS, and here there are accessibility settings on, um, on Android, but also Windows, Linux, and iOS as their own uh, accessibility feature. And they are, let's say, pretty, or nowadays pretty standard. You have, uh, you see here, for instance, macOS split the, the accessibility setting in vision, hearing, uh, and so on. And you can also uh, enable this uh, without any problem, even if you, you may be uh, also for being more comfortable in some in some in some items and for instance you have the zoom that is the magnifier so you can enable this option and having things bigger on screen when you want and android has the same system this magnification that now is off and uh, and then other captions for instance here and also here it's oh, sorry here and you can also have uh, I don't remember spoken content, for instance, on macOS. I think it's spoken content. Um, yeah, it, or or maybe it's, it's it's down here in the list. But you can also have, for instance, a way to call Siri on the Mac uh, 
without voice, just typing. It's called type to Siri, and you can type the question for the, the virtual assistant, and uh, the virtual assistant will answer both vocally and uh, by putting on screen your uh, the, the the answer to your question. So this is a way to enable uh, some of this redundancy on any operating system and on any application that leverage on that operating system, because if you enable the zoom or the magnification, uh, you have this uh, uh, option enabled for every application that run and is compatible with these operating system level uh, features. And for instance, again, just to, to remind uh, the, the temporary, permanent and situational uh, aspects that we have seen last week, uh, you can have, uh, for instance, this type to Siri, uh, this could be useful for people that are non-vocal, so you can maybe not speak very well, so you cannot use a vocal assistant because you cannot speak, almost speak well, and permanently, but you, you can also use this in a situational way. You can enable it, maybe it's less useful on a, on a PC, it's more useful on a smartphone, so let's imagine that Google Assistant does the same thing. You can, it has actually, by default, uh, you can type your question instead of speaking. And this is also useful, again, in a situational context where maybe you are in a very crowded place, very noisy place, and you cannot, cannot speak because you can speak, but nobody will hear you because there is too much noise, too much people speaking, uh, or there is some music uh, and the television turned off, something like that. And so you can also type on this system instead of speaking. So again, this is uh, another example of this inclusive design because it could be used for many different things. Mm -hmm. But again, all of these obviously enable some sort of redundancy and compatibility with uh, assistant uh, technology in, in which you can enable multiple things here. So you can enable something under vision, something hearing, something speech that is down in this in this uh, in this uh, list, and also here you can increase the font size so see big things bigger. If you have any issue with with vision, again temporary or not, you can turn on caption, etc., etc., etc. So all of these rely on this idea of multimodal interaction, uh, and rely obviously on our senses. So. The, the formal definition that I, I was promising to you uh, of multimodal interaction is this. So multimodal interaction is a system, an application an interface that uses more than one sensory channel or mode of interaction. And then what again, the sensory channel is typical, typically our sense, our senses, and the mode of interaction is typically how we interact with a computer, so voice is a mode of interaction because voice is not a sense and so on. So this is, and you see, it's not so different from the definition that you gave me before. So to use more than one sense or mode of interaction to interact maybe together, maybe in a redundant way or by enabling compatibility with assistive technology with different culture, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And obviously multimodal interaction will rely on these five senses that are depicted here and the, the, the relative mode of interaction that we have. And from now on, we will go a little bit deep on these five senses and uh, mode of interaction. And in particular here, we are depicted five things so obviously we have a sense that is the sense of vision. That is the sense that we, in a certain way, explore more in this course. So up to now, if you think we just spoke about graphical, visual user interface. We never spoke about smell, hearing, gestures, voice, or other things. So most of the things, all the things that we have seen up to now, also in the design process, mainly were about observing things or graphical user interface. So we, we just cover a lot of vision during this course. And so uh, I, I will not spend a lot of time on vision 
in these slides just because all, all the course is about vision. So one sense, one sensor channel could be vision and, uh, and again, graphic user interface, all the things that we see in a screen and so on. The second sense is taste uh, depicted by this picture here because I didn't find last year actually a, a better icon to represent taste. Obviously you don't taste or speak with your tongue out, but that's another story. Then there is the sense of touch. That is not touching things like on a touch screen. It's more the sense of the skin. The fact that you understand that something is on your skin, uh, the pressure on your skin, that something is cold or hot. So the, the senses of touches, of touch things and understanding, deriving information from the environment by touching things. So understanding that uh, this is uh, different than touching the other hand. And you, you sense this typically. So vision, taste, touch, hearing, the sense of hearing and smell, the sense of smell. And these are the five sensory channels that we can at most use. And these sensory channels are accompanied by different modes of interaction. So for instance, vision, better, the eyes uh, have vision mm, as a sense, but as gaze as a mode of interaction. So where we are looking at, mm, we are looking there, there, or another place. Mm. So where we are orienting our high sides, our gaze. With the mouth, we can taste things, but uh, as a mode of interaction, we typically have voice. Mm. So we can speak with other people, we can speak with a computer, we can emit uh, some sounds with the voice, with, with our mouth. Mm -hmm. So this is the mode of interaction, not taste typically, uh, but especially with a computer, but voice. With this other sense here, we are, again, the sensory channel is touch in that sense. So the skin that identify uh, things and is able to understand what we are touching. And this is not only about the hand, it could be also the skin on the, the arm or another part of the body. And similarly, we have gestures hmm, that are strongly related. Gestures are not uh, just gesture of an, one, one hand, but we also full body gesture could be movements that we are doing with our body. So these are, let's say in this, another mode of interaction. And then we have smell and hearing, where hearing, it's, it's not a really a mode of interaction. Again, it's more sensory channel. We cannot communicate. Hmm? White gaze, it's let's say, uh, we are providing gates. We are providing voice. In a sense, it's, it's output for it's Yeah, it's output for us. Uh, we are uh, we're, we're externalizing gaze, voice, and gesture. We are not externalizing hearing the smell. We are receiving information through smell, through hearing, to touch, to taste, and through, through vision. So we have, let's say, five sensory channel and three mode of interaction. And I have two questions for you. The first is probably the easiest one, and the second can be a little bit more complex. The first question is: Can we use all? of these sensor channel and mode of interaction together in a user in a user application in a user interface or we should or should we probably not now not all of them Okay, so we have a, a, a bunch of different answers. Uh, one is saying probably not now, but in the future with virtual reality and something like that. Uh, and the other two that basically say what, not all of them and the other is not at the same moment. Uh, yeah, th this is all, all of them at the same moment. So imagine a user interface that enable you to, to have this redundancy that we have seen before. So receiving all the information through vision, mm, taste, touch, hearing, and smell together. In, in, maybe not in the same exact moment, but in, let's say more or less. Uh, 
So obviously, yes, we cannot use all of these in a, in a unique user interface and all the user interface up to now. Uh, in the future, that, that is a, a, a nice comment. In the future with virtual reality, uh, so probably yes, with virtual reality, we can uh, incorporate, maybe not all of that together, um, but uh, uh, most of them, maybe it's easier to incorporate, imagine these uh, in, in virtual reality that not on a graphical user interface. But, but the key difference there is that we are not covering virtual reality in this course uh, because we, we follow the different process and this is just six credit and not 60. Um, but essentially the key difference with virtual reality and graphical user interface, let's say plain, not, not virtual in, in the real reality um, is that in virtual reality, you are typically inside the environment. So there is the full person inside the, the environment. So obviously you, you need vision, you need smell. You, you can use probably your senses to navigate a more complex environment because you are in a different virtual environment. Uh, instead with real reality, can you call it in that way? Probably not. Um, let's say non-virtual reality, uh, we are in, a, in an environment that is our virtual environment. So our senses are already uh, set up for uh, sensing the environment uh, and not only focus on, we are not immersed in an environment. But yeah, this is a, a good comment. Probably with virtual reality, some of these things could be a little bit different, will be a little bit different. Not now, because basically now you can have vision, gaze, a little bit of gaze, not a lot of gaze now, some products as gaze, and gesture, you know, touch, gesture, and voice, you can have voice, not taste, Hearing, you will have absolutely uh, hearing and you don't have smell in virtual reality. Uh, what about augmented reality? Uh, in which sense? For this or in general difference between augmented and virtual reality? For this virtual reality, Uh, sorry, augmented reality. I don't think that there is a, a huge difference. So for sure, we cannot use all of these neither now, neither in virtual reality and in augmented reality and uh, real reality. Uh, let's say that it's probably easier to imagine multiple, uh, a, a big usage of all of these or most of these in virtual reality than in augmented reality or in the real reality. So for, for this probably augmented reality is similar to the real reality, let's say, to, to just define, because you are not immersed in an environment. And also because augmented reality could be done with the, uh, with the, 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 say the eye glasses for virtual reality, but also with a smartphone or something like that. So you are not, you are just creating a user interface where there is not, but yeah, for, for now, not. Okay, uh, the other question is, uh, which of these uh, we are as human being using most? So we can, can we do a, uh, we can we rate these from the most used in our experience, not with a computer, as human beings to the one the sense, let's say just the sense that we use least in our life. We are obviously using all of these, if we can use all of these, but uh, which is the one that we use the most and the one that we use the least for sensing the environment, for instance. So the, Okay, so we have a bunch of answer. Vision the most and it's right. So vision is the one that we use the most. Not like in, in, in human computer interaction, in human computer interaction vision nowadays is like 99% of, uh, of the space. Uh, for humans is not this uh, impressive as a number. It's used, but let's say, not for sure 99%, it's quite used. 
It's the first place, obviously, we rely a lot on visions, uh, on vision, but is is not is is probably again the, the most used is not the, as much as used as in virtual reality in uh, in human computer interaction or with the graphical user interface. Uh, then we have uh, smell the least, really, smell the last. I, I don't agree. Well, it is not the last smell. Um, the, then we have vision, earring, touch, smell, taste, taste, and smell. So actually, the that is the, the, the right uh, the right score. So vision is the first one. We are using most of our vision system uh, for understanding and sensing the, the environment. Earring is currently the second one. But again, differently from human computer interaction and uh, user interface in general, vision and hearing as human beings are more or less at the same level. We are using a little bit more vision, but we're using a lot hearing. Maybe not intentional hearing, but when we are in an environment, we heard things that happens. And we, if we notice a strange sound, we just have a peak of attention and we, we notice that something is, is bad. So we, we are just always hearing things like we are also seeing things. So these two are really vision a little bit more used, but these are really more or less on the same level. Uh, the third in position is touch and is correct. We, we sense a lot of things by touching in, in the sense of understanding the environment, obviously. Way less, let's say that vision and hearing are the top two. Uh, like more or less at the same level in, in the human beings. Uh, taste, uh, sorry, touch is meaning of the sense of touching is the third place with a, a significant gap between the first, the first two and this. Uh, and then we have uh, smell, obviously. We, we, we use smell in reality a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, probably as much as touch because we, we maybe not notice, like with ear, hearing, we maybe don't notice, but if we smell something strange in the environment, if you smell something that is coming from another room, you immediately notice that and react. So we don't intentionally smell, but as for hearing, we always smell and we use that sense for sensing from the environment, uh, in positive or negative. So we are using smell quite a lot. So it's not definitely, it's not the least, uh, the last one. And yes, the last one uh, is taste. We typically don't taste things to understand how, uh, how they are. We look at things, maybe we, mm, we touch things, maybe then we have smell and hearing. Well, not, not these things here, uh, but typically we don't eat things just to understand if they are plastic or cold or hot. We just taste things if they are probably uh, something to eat for dinner or lunch or something like that. Absolutely. And so this is for the human being. And from uh, human computer interaction, we have said that vision is absolutely the most used. 90%, 99% number like this is the predominant system. And that's also why we, we focus a lot of our course on vision. Uh, the second one in human computer interaction in user interface is, I already told you, but remember the touch, that doesn't mean touch, touching things, the sense of touch. Touching things can be uh, in, inside gestures. Uh, hearing, yes. So if you think when you're using a computer, there is, for instance, the noise. When you empty the trash, there is a noise. So we are using in a user interface and human computer interaction, hearing quite a lot. And we're also using gesture in that sense, especially with smartphone, tablets, and something like that. And so, and the other two, are we using, do you think that in human computer interaction, we use smell and taste? 
No. Different opinion? Yeah, actually it is true. We are, we could use, actually smell is, is a really nice sense that can provide different, um, different feedback from the environment. It's, it's, it's rich, not maybe like hearing, but it's quite rich, similar to hearing, let's say. And we are not using it a lot. We will see a, a couple of examples actually in these slides about something that uses smell for providing feedback from the environment when the other senses are already used or should focus on other things. And absolutely we don't use taste in human computer interaction and is rarely uh, explored. Why, why smell, it makes a sense. Uh, we, we typically don't put things in, in our mouth in the, the real world and also in uh, um, in user interface or interactive system, we don't rely a lot. We don't rely, let's say, basically, uh, we in taste, what we taste. Uh, obviously, all of this is about sensory channel and senses. Uh, in human with interaction, we rely on gaze, we may rely on gaze, we may rely on voice, and we absolutely rely on gestures from touch screens and, and so on. And so, uh, uh, in human with interaction, the most used probably is gesture followed by voice uh, and uh, gaze. Does touch include vibration? It may, it may include vibration. So if you have a smartphone in your hand and this is vibrating, so probably that is touch. But if the smartphone is on the table and the, the smartphone is vibrating and the table is vibrating, so it's producing noise that is hearing. It depends where the smartphone is. Okay, so any other question on this? Just panoramic overview on our senses and mode of interaction. So, as I already told you, most interactive system that we use, I, I, I said 90%, 99%, but this is, a, maybe it is not the precise number, but most of them, the vast majority of them are predominantly visual. So we, in this moment, so if you think Zoom is visual, we don't have any other sense used while we are using Zoom, the chat is textual, so you type things. You can speak maybe, but you are not involving any other sense. You can listen to me, but that, that's why there is another person from another side uh, of, of the world or the city or whatever, of the internet, let's say, that is speaking. But per se, the user interface is not providing any things that are not visual. All the elements, the button, the icon are all visual. Sometimes the, the graphical user interface, predominantly, uh, make use of simple sounds hmm, just to add more, uh, just to add uh, some bit of information. Hmm. And typically this sound is just for confirmation or for, or because it's happens something on the screen. So something pop up on screen and you also have a sound that, uh, highlight that something popped up on a screen. And in general, WIMP-based user interface tend to add more and more visual information on the screen and ignoring all the other senses and all the other channels. I, I don't remember if we, uh, maybe after the first lecture, we explain you uh, WIMP, W W I M P, what stand for? It's an acronyms for. Uh, 
uh, almost. So it, uh, it's not Windows icon mouse pointer. Yeah, it's window uh, icon menu and pointers. So basically all the uh, desktop uh, user interface are WIMP because we have window, a lot of windows. Uh, we have icons to identify things. We have menus that open, contextual menu, normal menu and so on. And we have pointers because we have a mouse that uh, use, uh, for, for which we move a pointer. Uh, so smartphone from a sense are not WIMP based because we, let's say in most of the smartphone, we don't have window. We have icons, we have some menus, but not in the sense of the, the file menu or the edit menu uh, on a user interface on computer. And we don't have pointer because we are using touch. So we are just pressing things. So we don't see the movement on screen of our uh, finger like this. We cannot do this thing on a, we cannot see this thing uh, on a smartphone on a touch screen. If you move our uh, finger on a smartphone in this way, we are moving elements on screen and so on. So this is from a smartphone and behind is not uh, totally WIMP based. So traditional user interface on computer are still WIMP based for most. So, and this is again, something that is strongly related to WIMP, but also obviously happens in smartphone and other uh, typical uh, user interface of this, of this kind. A lot of visual because visual it's easy to, to do, we have a screen, so we can put things on the screen, we can use colors, we can use text. So it's a, a rich uh, way of seeing, uh, interacting with, with the computer, providing output from the, the computer to the, to the person. But a system become more complex, the visual channel could be overloaded if we put too much information uh, in a user interface. So you need to provide all this information you can overload the visual channel. You can have the person that is ignoring some information that appeared on screen and really should not because that is an important information. So this could be obviously minimized with good design and deciding which information should go where and providing the right information at the right place in the right time and so on. But if you have a, if you have a really complex system, you risk to have the visual channel overloaded and this could bring to frustration and errors, obviously. Uh, the, uh, in addition to, uh, um, uh, let's say a good design for minimizing this problem overloading the visual channel, uh, there is also a training that could serve for solving partially this problem. So if you imagine a cockpit of an airplane, do you have more or less Picture this more or less in the mind, in your mind, or have a look on Google uh, on let's say traditional cockpit. You you'll see that the cockpit has a lot of things. The pilot has a lot of things uh, in front of him: screens, not screens, button, lever, uh, joysticks, uh, and so on. So a lot of items to see. And so in that case, the visual channel is probably overloaded because it has to to look at different things in front of him, on the left, on the right, on the top, button, lights and so on. So this is a complex system where the visual channel is overloaded. But in this case, for instance, cockpit or on night plane, uh, and, and, you, and they obviously have a lot of information shown and maybe not all, not, not all this information are important in any single moment during a flight. Uh, but cockpit are still complex. Uh, and I have this, this problem. And obviously you don't want that the pilot to get frustrated or makes error when flighting. So why in that case, that complex system is, is still in that way? Well, because you assume, so the, the creator of the system, assume that the user that are going to use that system are highly trained to do that. It's not, a random pe person that is going there and flighting uh, an airplane, but is a person that do a, a lot of study, a lot of practice, uh, a lot of experiment before going there. 
So they are highly trained to control and manage that very complex system. So they know where to look at, let's say, when it's the right time, when to look at a certain point, and when it's probably it's probably say uh, not so important to look at a certain point. So obviously, all of these hold for that system, application, user interface for which you don't require the user to be trained for a year or a month before using the system. We are, in this case, we are speaking about uh, more it's a consumer application for things that you can uh, turn up, turn on and use, let's say, almost immediately without training, without studying, without reading books for start to get starting to use that. Uh, also, in the case of Kukubit, that is a complex system for doing complex operation. And uh, a, a lot of people who are expert on flight and aviation say that that system should not be, that interface mm, that is pretty complex, even the most, in, in the, the newest airplane with screens, touch screens and so on, say that it should not be uh, simplified too much. Uh, because they are expert at work and they know how to touch things and uh, simplifying things could also mean that you are uh, avoiding information or you are not reporting information that at certain point could be really useful. So in that case, it's a complex system for high training people and should probably remain enough complex for that kind of operation. And with low error and low frustration, because again, they are trained. Uh, and this is, well, our point is about this visual channel and complexity. And obviously, if we can use multiple modes of interaction, we can rely on multiple senses, we can rely on multiple uh, interactive way, like interactive modes, like voice, gaze, and so on, we can increase the bandwidth of interaction. We can create a, an interaction that is richer because we can uh, interact with a computer in, in, with a system in different way, with different model, modality. And so we are increasing the richness of interaction. And we should also think when we think about increasing the bad weight of interaction, we can also think about, we should also think about increasing the redundancy of interaction. So people get distracted, things happen in the life, things happen in the environment. So having not only different senses that are involved or different uh, modality of interaction that are involved for increasing the richness of interaction, but also having these things working together and signaling that things happens in multiple way could be useful for get the attention, especially for important information, not for everything, otherwise it would be a mess, but for important and fundamental information could be useful to have this redundancy, as we said before. And these are two examples of uh, multimodal uh, user interface. Uh, just I just picked uh, one from my computer and the other one from the internet. So let, let's start from the, this one. Do you know what is this one here? Yeah, it's Siri. It's Siri where if you can imagine on a smartphone or a tablet on a computer yes this is siri on macos and it's it's quite simple uh, i i, I asked i asked what time is it and it, the answer was it's seven it's five PM and one minutes, and they also have this picture here, uh, and that's it, a window open. So why this is multimodal? Well, actually this uses multiple senses together because it uses vision to show me things. Uh, it uses hearing, I'm using hearing because this thing speak. So I say with speech, what time is it? And uh, the answer is, produced by the computer as a sound, and the answer is it's, it's uh, 1701. So this answer is both depicted at video, vision, 
and spoken by the computer, so hearing. So we just have vision, hearing, and speech. Working together, because I speech with them, with the computer, and the computer provide two modalities together, hearing and vision, to provide this information. And not only I speech to, to get this started, but last year, I also pressed a button, an icon somewhere to start to wake up, let's say Siri. And so I perform a gesture to wake up this. So here in this example, we have two output mechanism from the computer, vision on screen and hearing by producing voice. That is our, let's say input and uh, gesture and speech for giving command to the computer. We, I, I gave a gesture for turning on this, this assistant and I spoke to, to ask this question. Do you know what is this? Or what is was this? Smart screen means something for the car. No, it's not something for the car. It's something for the home. So maybe it's a smart screen, but I don't know the definition of smart screen. Yeah, okay. This is the Eco Show. It's a normal assistant, yeah. Uh, no, it's not the karaoke for singing. Yeah, oh, actually, it can be used, but this is the, the Amazon Eco, one of the Amazon Eco, the Eco Show. Uh, in this moment, it has a song on it. Um, and it's playing this random song. I, I took this image from, from the internet. So uh, actually I, I, I took the, the one that uh, was available. And so actually it has a song on it and there is highlighted the sentence, the, the part of a song that is actually on. So this is again, it's multimodal because you can interact with this thing with speech Obviously, it's uh, as an Amazon Eco, so it has Alexa. You can say, Alexa, tell me the weather or what time is it, or uh, play some music and something like that. And it plays some music. It also has a screen, so it, it has speech. It has obviously uh, enabled hearing because it has speakers, and this is a song, so probably it will uh, play some music. And uh, it also has vision and gesture because it has a screen, so it say, okay, we are in this specific sentence of the song and this, the song is at this point and this is the information of how, how long the song is and we are one minute and 25 in the song, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So it has all this visual information that are not conveyed entirely in the other, like in hearing, like in this case, in this case, we are all the things that are shown on screen were also conveyed identically uh, in hearing. In this case, we heard about the song and we look at the text of the song and other contextual information of the song. So this is partially redundancy because we are just hearing the song and we also uh, reading about the song. Or if this is, for instance, a, a audiobook, you hear, you listen to the audiobook, but also read the audiobook if you want. And, but also we have other information like the time here, the, the overall duration, the fact that this is the current sentence and not the, the one that is after or the one that is before. And we also have a gesture. We can scroll of these, we can move this uh, indicator uh, on the left, on the right, so go forward or not. We can tap on the screen and we start from some menus. We can speech during the song and say, pause, stop, next song, previous song. So we can interact with this thing in a rich way while it is doing the specific task that is playing a song. So also this is another example of multimodal in which there is a bit of redundancy. And again, hearing and vision, there is something that is redundant and some other information that are not provided in uh, vocally, in speech from the speakers, but just on screen, like the, the amount of time. So again, you see here that there is some 
information that makes sense to have redundant, redundant, in this case, the song, in this case, the time, and other information that are only on screen, because maybe they are of lesser importance, like the time here, the fact that we have more or less a, uh, half of the song, and here, the fact that this is today, and that is uh, zero hours, in another time zone, because we are obviously, I was in the same, I am in the same time zone of this picture, and this is the, the clock application and not other things, or, or the help button is not needed to pronounce the help button. So we can actually have this, uh, a bit of redundancy for the important information, especially with vision plus. Uh, hearing, let's say, so the, the things that the computer is speaking that we heard, that let's say here the focus is the human, not the computer. And so the vision is the vision of the, of the human, the gesture is the human that does a gesture, hearing is the, the human that heard or listened to something, and speech is the person that speak, not the device. Uh, so just to, to clarify this uh, caption here. So these are multimodal and these are around us. If you have a uh, because, or if you have an Android smartphone on the US, you can have a Google Assistant or whatever it is. And, and so generate something like this. And if you have an Amazon Echo or a Google Home or again, whatever, you can have also this, this kind of thing here. Uh, any other multimodal interface that came to your mind? Kinect might be an example, it's a gesture to the Xbox. Well, the Xbox with the Kinect, it's, it could be an example of multimodal, not in, uh, in the sense of redundancy, not in that sense, because on the Kinect, you are using the Kinect as an input modality for the Xbox, and then the Xbox is providing uh, an output through the screen. So it's not redundant in that sense, it's not a richer interaction because it's just a way of communicating. So here, the difference between that is this, is that here we are using, let's say two, hearing and vision, hearing and vision, modality for uh, of input of this device and two input modality together. You can also use in contemporary. Kinect and the Xbox, traditional Xbox, is just a different way of in using instead of the controller, and you have just one modality for input and one modality for output. Google Maps, Google the smart speaker are, are similar to to these. Uh, PlayStation Move, uh, I, I I'm ignorant. I don't know what is. I know what is a PlayStation. I don't know exactly PlayStation Move what is in particular. Uh, but yeah, GPS navigator, a Google Maps voice for giving direction could be a, a way because you have a, a primary output that is the map and you also have the voice that is providing the, let's say important information uh, from the voice. So there is a little bit of redundancy there. Voice command to make a call in the car, yes, could be very, very, let's say maybe simple example. Uh, because you can maybe press a button and uh, have the command in the car, or you can use maybe the touch screen on the car to do the call. But yeah, it's uh, in that case, again, like in the, in the Google Maps or the GPS navigator, it's just output uh, or input, like in this case, just one side of the, of the, uh, of the coin. But yeah, this car example of a multimodal interface, just put together two things. This, this thing here in the slides are a little bit more complex, but yeah, these are all, all good example. Um, so let me start with this in depth and then we will continue tomorrow since it's 10 before seven. Uh, so now we are trying to do in depth all, all, all of these senses and mode of interaction. We are obviously skipping, as I said before, vision because we, spoke a lot about vision in the course. We will focus on gaze for what's concerned vision and a little bit on the others. Uh, some of them like hearing and voice in a more prominent way because they are more useful, more used and something like smell and taste 
a little bit less. Hmm? But let's start with vision that we, we spoke a, a lot about it. So vision for, for human is a highly complex activity. And again, is often the main source of information followed strictly by hearing. And how we see, we see through the eyes that essentially we receive lights through the eyes and we transform that in electrical energy. And here the slides uh, briefly summarize how things happen in a high and in our vision system that is made by the eyes, but it also made by the brain. And so it's, it's a more complex system than just the single eye, the, 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 the couple of eyes. So uh, basically it works in this way. Uh, we have lights that is reflected that hit some objects and this light is reflecting from objects in the world and their image, the image of the object. So let's say this, the image of this is focused upside down. So in this way, this is a bad example, but uh, let's say this. So this little pencil from Ikea. Uh, so this is the object in, we see the object in this way, upside down on the back of the eye of both of our eyes. At that moment, we see this picture here, this, this, this pencil here, smaller and top down, uh, upside down. And our, the receptor in our eyes that are different types, the one for lights and the one for, one for brightness, one for colors, and they work together without going into details. Basically this is a receptor that are different kind, uh, transform that picture, small picture uh, upside down into electrical signal that were passed to the brain and the brain detect patterns, movement, uh, and try to, identify what is that things that we are seeing, if it's something that we already know, is something totally new, and we react once we understand what is this. So if we know that this is a pencil, we know how to use this. And these things, this operation, the light hit the, the pencil and the light is reflected in our eyes and we see this upside down and the processing on our uh, brain is something that happens in, in, instantly. So we see these and we know how to use these and what, what is name, let's say in Italian and English, maybe in other languages, and we know how to use it. We know how to take this in our hands and so on. So this is how briefly from 10,000 feet, how, uh, how our vision system works. And so th this is the way in which we see graphical interface, we see color, we recognize objects, we recognize form, we recognize patterns, we recognize movements around us in the world and also in virtual reality or in graphical interface. But together with vision uh, and with our eyes, we have gaze. So we can move, we move our eyes to see different things in different place. And we can use this movement of the eyes, especially the, of the papules of the eyes to control a computer with eye tracker or eye gazed interfaces through dedicated hardware that use the track, the pupil of our eyes and understand where we are looking at on a screen or in a space in the environment. So we rely on gaze. In photos, we notice if people is looking at another place and not on the camera, for instance. So we can also rely on gaze to uh, understand other people. And a computer can use gaze in a, a lot of way to control a user interface. For instance, typically through a net tracker, an hardware device that is able to get the pupil of the person through eyeglasses or not, and identify where the person is looking again in a screen or in a space. And this could be used as an input mechanism in combination with other mechanism. I can have a user interface that is redundantly using mouse, keyboard, and a tracking. So you can maybe augment something that happened in the screen. So if I move here, maybe I'm also looking there and something happens in this specific point because I put together these two inputs mechanism to do something, for instance. And when we are using gaze, so 
one, one moment in which we are using this a lot is for people with disability, for accessibility. And we are using this in combination with other input modality to find more efficient and novel way to facilitate the interaction with user with, for user with disability. Again, or, or user that has temporary situational problem in moving and maybe highs could be a good way to providing inputs on a computer. But also using gaze and eye tracking data, as you have seen briefly in the uh, visual design lecture for understanding human behavior, how we look at a screen, if we are if in the website where we are looking. So also to understand if the, the high time that we, that's really important is something that everybody ignores or is something that everybody pay real attention on that. And so we can maybe move things on the screen according to uh, the usage of your web application or your application also not web where people are, are looking actually. So we can use this data to understand human behavior, to understand where I'm looking, where I'm clicking, uh, if I'm looking more on the left, on the right, on the top, on the bottom, and generalize a bit this information and also to explore novel interfaces. I, I told you before, we can maybe mix together high tracking with uh, mouse. And if we're looking at a place where also there is the mouse, something could happen. Uh, while if I have the mouse here, but I'm looking in another place, something different could happen. So also to explore novel user interface, novel interaction way. And just because uh, virtual reality was mentioned before, we can also use, we could use gaze also in virtual reality to understand where a person is not only rotating their heads, that could be again in the area or move of gestures, movement, moving the head, but also where the user is actually looking in that direction. If I'm looking straight, if I'm looking a little bit on the left, on the right, and so on. So all of these could be uh, made with gaze and the hardware device to collect gaze either in the, the real the reality as we called before in on screens, graphical user interface, also in virtual reality are eye tracker. That are where we are going to start tomorrow because it's two minutes before seven. So we can, I think, stop here also because I, I will not cover eye tracker in two minutes. So uh, do you have any question? Otherwise I will stop the recording and uh, we will meet tomorrow to continue speaking about multimodal interaction and specifically senses and mode of interaction that we can use to augment and uh, put a redundancy in our application, that, in the application that we design or that we are going to use to create. Okay, so no question, uh, I will stop the recording and we will see tomorrow at uh, uh, 11.30 on, on the link on Zoom.